What happens if you take video game the sapling, design a planet, design a basic alga and a really simple aquatic animal and then turn on random mutations for millions of in-game years? That is what this YouTube series called Evolution Simulated is about. In the previous video we explored how life evolved underwater and how already animals dragging themselves onto land was a pretty common sight. These are still very much aquatic animals however, and they only come here to lay their eggs in a safe place and then die. Furthermore, we saw that after several failed attempts, finally a plan emerged that checked all necessary boxes and took off. But how exactly did it beat the heat that killed off the previous attempts? To be honest, I don't know for sure, but I do observe that the plants with the most primitive leaves and body shapes are here, in the northwest, so this is probably where it all started. This area has some more hills, which is important because the higher you are above sea level, the lower the temperature. During the normal season, these temperatures here were actually on the low side of what our new primitive plant could handle. But once the hot season kicked in, these hills functioned as a refuge, shielding the plants from the scorching heat below. As a result, the hills are now a breeding ground for all kinds of mutations, like these called hardy leaves, which allow the plants to live higher up in the mountains, and this plant, which will survive basically anywhere else. This one in particular we will see so often that I'll give you the name the procedural naming system came up with, Milagia. The emergence of Milagia is a typical example of what always happens when plants are to colonize new unoccupied land. A super versatile generalist plant pops up that spreads quickly and can live nearly anywhere. Over time, we will see that Milagia and its generalist descendants will need to give up more and more of their territory to more specialized species, but so far, it really grows everywhere. Speaking of specialization, underwater an obligate carnivore has emerged, meaning that it relies on meat and meat only. Whereas the carnivores we saw in the previous episode could still eat algae in times of need for a few inefficient calories, these animals have traded that safety net for the ability to extract even more energy from meat. The result is an even smaller population size, only 24 when I filmed this, but it is pretty stable. There's also specialization going on in the other direction. At this time there are about 700 true herbivores in the world, feeding exclusively on algae. The land and aquatic ecosystems we have at this point will remain pretty stable for some time. The only change we can see is that slowly but steadily, large underwater species become more and more successful, probably because they have the advantage of having a larger part of the ocean available to them. A special mention here goes to a species called Zerilops, the first ones to reach the largest body size. Zerilops is a small and unimportant species right now, but the advantage of space will turn its numerous descendants into the rulers of the ocean many years from now. However fascinating this tendency to grow larger may be, it is not good news for my personal hopes that a terrestrial animal will evolve. This is because early land animals move slowly and so won't be able to reach a lot of food sources before they die, but large animals do need lots of food. Fortunately, for plants the same gradual body size increase is happening. As plants become better and better at collecting energy, larger versions of themselves are feasible and these larger organisms start to outcompete the smaller ones. In other words, the fields of Melagia are turning into forests, or perhaps more appropriately, jungles. About 50,000 in-game years after we started, one of the large animals hatching from an egg at the coast is born with a mouth that is able to get so much oxygen out of the air that there is no need to go into the water anymore. Instead, it will eat, reproduce and die entirely on land, without going for a swim in its entire lifetime. Make no mistake, this species won't hesitate to take a dive, for example when it notices a tasty alga in the water, but the big innovation is that it does not have to, meaning that it is able to live further inland. Not really that much further, I should add, because this planet remains searing near the equator, in particular during the warm season. Like early plants before them, early terrestrial species spent their time exclusively in the north. The main advantage of living on land is the space. In the water, in particular near the coast, it is often so crowded that some organisms spend their entire lifetime bumping into others and then die of starvation. Our new land dwellers won't have this problem, at least not initially, but instead run into a new one. As they have no eyes, they move around randomly until they discover food. As I mentioned before, the dragging style of movement is slow, so an individual can only try a handful of places within its time on this planet. 
You can imagine that the first species that develops faster feet below the body immediately has a huge advantage here, as accidentally going into an area devoid of plants or meat no longer means certain death. Species with feet below the body and species with feet to the side will coexist for some time, but as they occupy the same niche, the faster animals will eventually outcompete the slower ones. So far, land life has been confined to the western continent. In this game there is no way for plants to spread over the water, so we really have to wait until the conditions are just right for land plants to evolve there too, separately. That finally happened in roughly the same time period that the first land animals appeared in the west. This is how they spread over a period of 10,000 in-game years. As you can see, the south is where the first larger plants caught on. This species, with its large circular leaves, is one of the two major plant families that will dominate the east in the end. The other is a family characterized by having one large branch. You can already see early members of that family growing here on the eastern mountain. Several thousand in-game years later, we encounter land animals that live quite a bit lower, closer to the equator. This species has branched off recently and owes its success to a primitive calm, a fleshy growth that it can use to regulate its temperature. Another change is that this animal is no longer an omnivore like the rest of the land dwellers. Instead, it has specialized in eating plants, which, unlike meat, are present in ample quantities in this region. One strategy for these animals to live further south is to only go there during the normal season and then go for a refreshing swim during the warm season. There's a lake here, so far not containing life because the algae never managed to reach it, that happens to be positioned just right for this lifestyle. But the true solution, that also works in areas where there are no lakes around, emerges a few thousand years later, a larger cone. This species, named Lydalops, can tolerate so much heat that they can thrive in even the hottest jungle year round. Lydalops is the first to reach the south of the continent, where temperatures are again much colder. An obvious solution to survive here would be to lose the comb again, but this is not what happened. Instead, it battled the cold by evolving a coat of fur. Underwater, in the meantime, a phenomenon has happened that I like to call temporary photophobia, which I've already seen a few times before on other planets. It works as follows. In this game, it is relatively common for animals to evolve photoreceptors, which they use to see light. If one area is particularly crowded while there still is a lot of empty space elsewhere, it is advantageous for animals to spread a little more, so the available resources can be divided better. This is achieved by also developing a simple form of bioluminescence, combined with an instinct to go away whenever they see light. In other words, these creatures use light to scare each other away, with the goal to discover new territory. This phenomenon is always short-lived though, because it won't take long before the animals have explored everything there is to explore, and then this behavior suddenly becomes a disadvantage. To stop this behavior again, one of three things need to happen. The animals lose the light, the animals lose the receptors, or the animals lose the instinct to go away from light. In this case, they lost the receptors, but not the luminescence. This results in an animal that has luminescent organs instead of eyes, emitting light that it can't see itself. In the current ecosystem, this has no disadvantages, so while there is no reason to keep it, there also is no reason to lose it. By pure chance, it stays as it is, and becomes the defining characteristic of a small but stable family that lives in the shallow water between the continents. But they are not the only creatures swimming there. Next week, in the final video in this series for now, we will see how developments in this narrow body of water will change the eastern ecosystem for good. If this video made you want to play the game, you can. The sapling is available in early access on Steam and Itch. Besides the sandbox mode, which we are exploring in this series, the game also has campaign challenges to teach the player about all the intricacies of the simulation. It uses very little text, but instead starts really simple and gradually makes the simulation more and more complex, so you can figure it out like a puzzle. If you want to run a simulation like this for yourself though, a bit of a warning. I'm using the largest map size here, and with the simultaneous simulation of algae, animals and plants, both underwater and on land, there is a lot going on. 
To still get decent frame rates, I'm using a high-end gaming PC. Nearly every patch I release for the game contains some sort of optimization for some aspect of the game though, so slowly but steadily you should be able to run larger map sizes on less powerful hardware. Just be aware of the fact that the game is not fully there yet. If you are more interested in this whole development side of the project, there are also devlog videos on this channel and a Twitter feed for more fine-grained updates. Okay, see you next week.